Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we will start, and I uh, will let uh, my colleague uh, introduce us. Oh. Oh, not. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so uh, this is Alexandre. Uh, I'm Gaëtan. We are working both for, for Red Hat since, uh, now, since now from the, the Innovance uh, bot. Uh, we are from the uh, CIP department, so the Cloud uh, Innovation Practice. Uh, we are technical cloud co consultant. Uh, Alex is based in Paris, I'm based in uh, Montreal. Uh, as a technical cloud consultant, we had to deploy uh, many uh, cloud platforms like uh, public one, uh, private one, uh, using different methods, manually, automatically, etc. Uh, we had to support the platform that we deployed, and uh, we had issues during uh, this support, and uh, it will be uh, the subject of this talk. We will start first uh, by presenting to you our deployment uh, software. And uh, at Red Hat, we are using a product which is called uh, OSP Director. I don't know if uh, any of you heard about that, so please raise your hand if you heard about uh, OSP Director. OK. Uh, so OSP Director is using uh, Triple O. Triple O is uh, an OpenStack uh, project. And uh, the logic behind Triple O is to use the OpenStack to deploy OpenStack. So you will have the, an undercloud, which is the first OpenStack, and uh, an overcloud, which is the OpenStack you are actually deploying. And uh, on top of that, we are using Puppet modules to achieve uh, the configuration. Then we will talk uh, about our standard architecture to uh, achieve uh, HA, because uh, everybody wants to deploy OpenStack in HA. We will talk about the software we are using to achieve that, uh, how we are configuring the networks, and uh, what's possible with uh, OSP Director. And then we will also talk about uh, the, the way we are configuring the OpenStack components. Uh, next, we will talk about uh, three very important goals for every OpenStack uh, operational guys. The first one will be logging, so how to log all your OpenStack deployment. Second one will be monitoring how to monitor your cloud. And the last one will be backup, and uh, we will uh, um, share with you for this uh, free subject some tools we wrote that uh, are available on GitHub, and, uh, we will, uh, we, and we are very happy to share it with you. And the last part of the talk, which is uh, in fact uh, half of our uh, talk, is about sharing our experience as uh, uh, OpenStack operators for the last several years. So, uh, because we are using triple O, uh, we have an undercloud and uh, an overcloud. So the undercloud is can be a bare metal server or a virtual server. You will have to install a simple distribution on it, a rail, Fedora, depending of the project that you are using. When when the server is installed, you will have to install triple O uh, by uh, RDO Manager OCS plugin. Uh, this is a RDO project, so a community project, as uh, Fedora is for Rail. Um, when the other cloud is, uh, is ready, uh, you will be able to deploy the other cloud. Before deploying the other cloud, you will have to customize some uh, triple O templates. Triple O templates are just a YAML file, so it will be pretty easy to understand how to change some stuff inside. Um, and uh, when the, the template customization will be done, you will be able to run uh, the overcloud deployment. Uh, the overcloud deploy deployment will be handled by it as a stack. Uh, it will create resources, uh, like for example, uh, deploying um, the Nova instances by using Ironic, uh, eDeploy, and Triple O. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> so when you're Sorry. When your undercloud uh, is uh, uh, ready, the first thing you need to do is to uh, give some information about the servers you actually want to deploy to Ironic. To do that, you just have to write a very simple uh, JSON file uh, describing the IP IPMI information like uh, username, password, etc. And also the MAC address you will want to use to do the, the MAC address of the interface you will use to do the Pixie booting. 
When it's done, Ironic will be actually able to perform some actions on your servers. The first you will need to do is introspection. During this uh, phase, you will have <coughs> two steps. The first one is uh, to discover the hardware of your servers, and the second one is benchmarking your hardware. Uh, benchmarking is not mandatory, but it's uh, highly recommended. And uh, during the benchmarking process, every part of your server will be uh, tested, and uh, you will be able to, uh, with these results, to uh, make sure that every part of your server is uh, actually um, um, uh, as, the, ex uh, as the, the performance you uh, actually expect. And it's very important to do that before actually deploying, because at the end of the deployment, if something goes wrong, and I don't know, a hard drive is very slow, it will be way more uh, difficult to uh, debugging than if you are doing it uh, at the beginning. And when the discovery, uh, the hardware discovery is done, what's uh, the initrd? Uh, it's a special initrd which is called uh, discovery will do is to upload all those information to Swift, and also update the uh, Ironic database. And with all the, those information about the hardware of your server uh, stored in the Swift running on the under cloud you will be able to assign a Nova flavor to an Ironic node. Because before actually doing the deployment, Ironic needs to know which kind of node this server will be. If it will be a compute server, it will, if it will be a controller or a storage. <coughs> and you, of course, you can do that manually, but you also want to do that automatically if you have thousands of servers. And you will be able to do that with a tool which is called AHC uh, for Automated Health Check. And it will use the information stored in the Swift. And this way, you will be able to uh, assign a Nova flavor to a node, uh, an ironic node uh, in an automatic way. When the introspection is done, uh, you will be able to deploy the other cloud, as I said uh, before. But the customization has to be performed uh, before the deploy command. Uh, customization can be uh, like changing stuff in the network, in the storage, or what you have to change. For example, for the network, it can be the network isolation. So you want to use a single NIC, a bonding, with VLAN, without. The configuration can be like uh, which IP ranges should we use, uh, which gateway, everything related to the, to the network stuff. Um, the storage configuration is more related about Glance or Cinder, like, uh, for example, which backend uh, Cinder should use, uh, RBD1, uh, NFS1, ISCSI1, the one you have to define. Um, maybe some Nova stuff, like, uh, okay, I want uh, the live migration between computes, so you have to define this option in the template configuration. And uh, when all this configuration is done, if needed, you will be able to use uh, the pre- and the post-deployment process. So in the triple O world, uh, the pre will be the first boot, and the post will be the extra config. The first boot can be something like, OK, before running Puppet or whatever, I just want to be sure that every uh, disk are wiped. So it can be a pre-action. A pre and the post-deployment action can be like, um, I don't know, um, just adding a node to the monitoring platform, send an email to the OpenStack operator to say, hey, I'm deployed. When the customization is done, uh, you will be able to deploy the other cloud. Uh, deploy the other cloud, it's just a hit command with a, a few arguments, like uh, which, tenant, uh, which tenant method we want to use, um, NTP server, whatever you want. So you launch the hit command, hit create resources, like, for example, uh, resources for Nova, for spawning instance. Nova asks to Ironic to provision a node, a controller one, compute one, storage one, by using uh, a glance image that we upload before the deployment. And uh, when the deployment is, uh, is done, it will create new resources, uh, this time related about configuration. Uh, so it will just ask to Puppet to pass on each uh, node to configure controllers, compute, and safe. We are using uh, Puppet modules uh, from the community. And uh, Puppet is set up in a masterless configuration, uh, because you don't want your Puppet master to be a bottleneck. 
So in fact, in each node, you will find all the manifests. And uh, when uh, uh, the heat resources is actually applying the Puppet configuration, it will just run a Puppet apply on each node. The Puppet modules are also already stored in the Glance uh, image we are using to deploy. And uh, uh, one thing which is quite cool is you can override pretty much every parameter of your Puppet modules in the triple O templates. And you don't have to mess with the modules and the manifest stored on the nodes. Because we are using IRA, and IRA is getting all the variables from the triple O templates and feeding them back to Puppet. And uh, the one, uh, one last word about the Puppet orchestration, it's, it's, it's done step by step. So for example, during step one, we will make sure that the database, the MySQL server, is correctly set up and up and running before going to step two and step three. And step two, for example, will be where we, we are going the, to do the database synchronization for each of the OpenStack services. Uh, so this is uh, really <laughs> fast, quick, quickly uh, uh, the, the how we are deploying uh, um, softwares. So you can deploy as many compute nodes as you want, of course. You can deploy storage as you want. Uh, be sure to have uh, at least uh, three uh, nodes to uh, achieve a quorum and HR, of course. But uh, this is way more interesting for the controller. So by default, we are deploying three controllers. And for databases, we are using Galera in a, a free controller setup. And we are also using MongoDB and uh, Redis, but uh, only for Silometer. In front of uh, the back end, you will find a, a load balancer, which is HAProxy. So HAProxy is running in front of the Galera. It's also running in front of uh, RabbitMQ, we are using for the bus messaging, and in front of all the OpenStack services. And uh, all the services are actually handled by Pacemaker. So for example, if you want to restart just one services, you have to do it through Pacemaker and not with systemd or any other uh, init script. Um, this is the network list uh, provided and supported by uh, OSP Director. Of course, you can add the one, uh, you can add one more by just uh, editing the templates. Um, the first one will be the provisioning and management network. Uh, the provisioning network will be used uh, by Ironic to provision a node, a compute, storage, or controller. When the provisioning is done, uh, this network will become a management network. Uh, management because this is the one that you will use for monitoring, for backupping, or just for perform uh, operator uh, admin stuff, etc., etc. Uh, next, you have the internal API. This network is uh, related about um, the cluster communication. So this is the one that will be used by Galera for have sync nodes, uh, the one used by RabbitMQ, um, the one used by uh, OpenStack component for the communication between each of them. And it will be the endpoint in the Keystone catalog. The tenant network is the, the network used for the tenant communication. By default, by default, we are using the VXLAN, but you can use uh, GRE or VLAN if you prefer. The storage network is uh, more about Nova, Glance, Cinder communication. Storage management, uh, only dedicated for the replication between uh, Ceph nodes, Swift nodes. And uh, the last one, the external network. So this is the one that you will want to use. For example, if you want to reach the Horizon dashboard, or maybe just to reach the Keystone uh, public URL. And it will also, uh, this one will be also used as a network for the floating IP. So now you have uh, an OpenStack deployed and running. And the first thing you will want to do is uh, uh, do some centralized logging system. So currently, the centralized logging is a tech preview in uh, OSP director. But some, for some projects we worked on, uh, it was mandatory. So our recommendation is to use the Fluendi Kibana Elasticsearch stack. So FluentD will be run on uh, each server and will collect all the logs and send them to Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch, which is the backend where all the logs will be stored. 
stored. And uh, on top of that, you will have Kibana, which uh, will display a very nice web interface with very nice graphs. And you will be also able to uh, search uh, through all the logs for a specific pattern. And it's really, really uh, useful when you have to debug, and you have to do it quickly most of the time. Uh, for example, if a virtual machine is not uh, uh, spawning uh, uh, up anymore, you will be able to search through all the logs and it will be uh, very uh, helpful to, to debug your OpenStack. Um, as for the logging, uh, monitoring is in tech preview. Um, we had to use it in some projects. Uh, so for doing that, we are using Sensu with uh, the Uchiwa dashboard with uh, common checks related to the system, for example, just to know if CPU, memory, disk, NTP, etc., is, uh, is, uh, is correct. And uh, we we using um, the checks uh, on the Stackforge Git repository uh, for monitoring the OpenStack platform. So uh, on this Git repository, you will find, you will find many checks uh, related about uh, RabbitMQ, uh, Ceph, Swift, etc. And you will find uh, a bunch of uh, end user checks, like upload uh, an image in Glance, uh, spawn an instance, assign a floating IP, create a volu volume, attach a volume to an instance, etc. So uh, these checks are very useful to be sure that your end user uh, are able to perform uh, actions that he will perform as usual. So having uh, um, a monitoring system is one thing. It's great for operators, but something you want to achieve too is to uh, um, uh, expose those information to your users. And uh, you don't want to give them access to your Sensu dashboard because it's maybe too complicated for them and uh, it, it can be risky for your security. So on one project we worked on, we just, from the Sensu monitoring, wrote a simple handler that will update a dashboard. And uh, to display a dashboard, we use, uh, we use the uh, project which uh, we found on GitHub, which is called uh, Whiskerboard. And uh, you will be able to display this kind of very simple uh, status page. And uh, so we are not web developers. And uh, there is only three uh, status. The first one will be green, so it means the service is up and running, everything is fine. The blue one is uh, the service is still running, but there is some uh, uh, trouble, so maybe it will be a little bit slower than uh, as, a as usual. It will be uh, some latency uh, uh, on the network, something is going on, but it's still running. And the last one is uh, uh, red, and uh, it's uh, critical, the service is down, uh, don't try to use it. We had to wrote a backup tool um, for allow end user to be able to back up his instances or volumes. Uh, this tool uh, has to be run on an external server, a bare metal one or a virtual one, with uh, a rail distribution, Fedora, CentOS. Pick what you want. Um, at this time, this tool uh, is only able to back up uh, safe, uh, safe volumes. Uh, so um, the, 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 when, the, when the end user wants to back up uh, instance or volume, it just, have, it just has to set a metadata on the volume. The metadata name is stackup, and it just has to define its, if uh, it's uh, true or false, true for backup and the false for no backup. If you decide to uh, back up uh, something, uh, a Unix account will be created on these external uh, servers with uh, his uh, tenant name, email, and uh, SSH key related to his tenant. And uh, this information will be sent by email to him, and he will be able uh, to, to connect on the server to get the data that he backed. Uh, actually, we are supporting three file systems, XFS, X3, and X4. And uh, we are using uh, the full and the incremental methods. Mm, the tools can be mm, configured with, uh, with a config file. Uh, inside of this one, you will find the retention, the, the retention of the backup, the RBD credential, the SMTP server, the logging. You can add some stuff. Um, and uh, this, uh, this tool is available on GitHub, already available on GitHub, so you can fork it and add some stuff on it. What is the name of the tool? Um, stack up. It's not officially, but... Uh, you will find the link uh, at the end of the, yeah. the slides. 
So um, now we will start the second part of uh, our talk, and uh, it's really about uh, sharing our experience and the issues uh, being uh, dedicated uh, operators on OpenStack platforms for the last uh, several years. So the first thing we want to share with you, it's really important and quite stupid, but you can uh, forget it really easily. It's to have uh, a time synchronization across all your servers. And of course, you will want to do that with uh, NTP servers and uh, uh, clients. Because for example, if uh, one of your Galera nodes is out of sync and want to join back, it will not be able to do it. And actually, there will be no uh, explicit messages in the Galera logs about that. So you can uh, spend uh, several hours trying to debug that, and it's just because uh, the time is not synchronized. It's the same with RabbitMQ. If, for example, uh, you, uh, you want to authenticate to Keystone, and one third of, a ti of the times uh, it will be denied. It, it means that one of the RabbitMQ is out of sync, but again, there is no uh, a clear message in the logs about that. And uh, same with uh, safe monitors, but uh, hopefully safe is a little bit more verbose about that, and you will find a very explicit uh, message uh, saying something is wrong with the times between all the servers. Many issues that we had uh, were related about network. Uh, the first one is uh, when you are using uh, a safe cluster, it's uh, to be sure that you, are yeah, that you define the, the right MTU. So if not, uh, and you are using uh, a safe cluster, you will have issues like performance, like uh, the mon are not able to connect to the OSD. So just pay attention to this, uh, to this parameter. Other issue was uh, related about the north-south and uh, east-west tra east -west traffic. So uh, the north-south, uh, it's when you are in the in the in the virtual machine in the instance, and you want, for example, just to run a YAM update, you will get the package, but it will be very slow. So it can be something related uh, about our issue, and uh, the east-west will be uh, the communication between uh, instances. On compute. So, if you have if you if you have uh, this kind of issue, or yes, issue, uh, you just will have to disable two flags, the TSO and the GSO, uh, on the QR, QBR, QVO, and the QVB interface. And uh, normally, this issue sh should be solved. Another issue, depending of your architecture, it's uh, the reverse pass filter. Uh, it's like okay, the traffic. Uh, enter through one interface and go, go out through another one. By default, this is uh, not possible. Well, it's, it's possible, but it's uh, disabled. So if you want to disable the, the RP filter protection, uh, you just will have to use a sysctl command. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty simple. And uh, the last one that we had, depending on the kernel version that you are using, and uh, only if you are using the XLAM, it's about disabling the GRO, GSO, and LRO flags on the physical interface on the compute. So depending on the VXLAN and the kernel version that you are using, you can have some compute crash. So it's uh, a bit annoying. So just uh, if you have that, pay attention to, the, to these flags. As I said, we are using HAProxy as a load balancer, but this is valid for all load balancers. And uh, uh, it's uh, really stupid too, but sometimes you just forget about this. And you have, uh, for example, with the max connection parameters and also the timeout, you want to, to set them in accordance uh, between your uh, load balancer and your backend. And when you are using uh, HAProxy, you have to do that in the HAProxy configuration file. Because, for example, if you have a very uh, high timeout for, let's say, Galera, set up on your Galera and a very uh, slow, uh, low uh, timeout on your HAProxy. HAProxy will be the bottleneck of uh, your backend, and you don't want your uh, load balancer to be the, back the bottleneck of your backend. So if you don't want to experience a lot of broken pipes, pay attention to, to this. I'm pretty sure that many of you uh, has, have already had issues with RabbitMQ. If you say not, you are liars. So uh, one of them, it's uh, related to the file descriptor. So by default, RabbitMQ uh, comes with uh, a little bit more uh, than 1,000 file descriptor. It's uh, the Linux, uh, default Linux value. Lin Linux value. Uh, so to avoid this kind of uh, 
issues. You just will have to increase this value. Uh, it depends on uh, the size of, of your platforms, the activity of your platforms. So if you don't want to hit the limit too soon, you just have to monitor this one and uh, raise it. This time, it's more related about uh, the configuration of the OpenStack component. So uh, RabbitMQ, OK, it's not easy to configure, but you have to be sure that on your component, the RabbitMQ configuration is correct. So uh, you have to enable the Rabbit, dura uh, the Rabbit Durable Queue to be sure that uh, when the RabbitMQ node crashed, the queue survived. Uh, another option to enable, it's a Rabbit HA queue. So with this parameter, uh, all the queues uh, related to a component will be synced between each RabbitMQ node. And uh, the last one, uh, it's about the orphan messages. And uh, we had this issue with it. Uh, it generates orphan messages. We don't know yet why, and uh, it's not the point here. But uh, if you have some, it's OK. But when you have thousands of orphan messages, RabbitMQ uh, will have to read each of them and he loses time, and you don't want that. So just, uh, just uh, set an expire policy uh, on the queue. MySQL is also a very critical uh, software when you are deploying uh, OpenStack. And uh, as I said uh, about uh, setting load balancer uh, limits and backend uh, limits in accordance, it's the same but uh, more system-wide for MySQL, for example. So the two parameters you want to pay attention to are, of course, open files limit and max connection. But uh, when you are changing uh, um, a parameter in MySQL configuration, sometimes it's not enough to do that in the configuration file. You have also to do it, in the, for example, here uh, for the uh, open files limit. In the systemd uh, units, you are using to start uh, the MySQL service. So pay attention, uh, depending on your distribution and uh, your setup, to um, push uh, any update on your configuration across all servers that can be involved in the, in the start process, for example, of the server. Sorry? Yes, we are no, doing No, we are that. doing it with Sensu. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, yeah, we are using Sensu to monitor everything, well, as the only monitoring tool. And um, so the other parameters you want to pay attention to is uh, max connection. And uh, as uh, for the RabbitMQ parameters uh, Gaetan told you about uh, before, you have to set them in accordance uh, to the activity of your cloud. And you have to monitor all the, the, the values we talked about, actually, not uh, only the number of uh, active connections. It's one of uh, the most important uh, for me, but monitor everything. And uh, be sure to set the limits um, according to the activity of your cloud. And uh, also be sure to take actions before you, acti uh, you are actually hitting the limits. Because when uh, you are uh, hitting the limits, the, the, the OpenStack will be stuck, and it will be very painful to uh, set it set it uh, uh, running again, so pay attention to that and uh, take action before the OpenStack is stuck. Um, one issue that we had uh, with Keystone, not only one, but this one is the, the, the one who come every time, uh, before Juno, of course, uh, it's about the token flash. So uh, before Juno, uh, the Keystone, uh, the Keystone uh, token flash command was a little bit stupid. Like, OK, uh, I see token in the tables, in the table, it's OK. I will delete, but one by one. So it's OK if you have a few tokens. But if you have thousands of thousands of thousands of thousands expired token, it will be very pain painful for the keystone for the database. So if you're running uh, an older OpenStack version, you will have to use PT Archiver, so PT for Percona Toolkit, to delete the token by bulk of for example, here, uh, 500. So it will be quicker and uh, safer for your keystone and your database, uh, only if you are running a, a nice house or a grizzly uh, version. So uh, 
MongoDB and Silometer can be also uh, a big issue. I'm sure everybody already experienced that. Uh, lot of, uh, a lot of OpenStack components are sending metrics to Silometer, and Silometer is storing it to his MongoDB backend, so that's fine. But if you are just using one replica set and you have a lot of activities in your cloud, after several weeks, it will not be suffi sufficient, and MongoDB will run very slowly, and Silometer will be slow too. So one thing which is really easy to do, and I'm sure everybody heard about that before, but for those who don't, set up a sharding uh, uh, instead of a replica set in your MongoDB. And if you can, and if you already know when you, before deploying that Silometer will be very important and all those metrics will be very useful to do that to, for you, do that before doing the uh, actual deployment. You can switch from a replica set to sharding afterwards, but it will be way more uh, difficult and it will take a long time. And uh, for those of you who don't know which is sharding, I will try to explain it really quickly. Uh, let's say you are storing uh, um, documents about people. You will have the last name, for example, of, your, uh, of the people. And you will say to MongoDB, instead of writing everything to one replica set with uh, just one primary node will take, will take uh, all the uh, writes, you say to MongoDB, OK, we have two replica sets. And for people, for example, with their last name beginning between an A and an N, you will write uh, documents about them in the first replica set. And for the other people, you will write to the other replica set. So it's quite easy to set up, and uh, Silometer will be way more faster, and you will be able to use all those metrics. Um, by default, Ceph is, uh, is resilient by design. So when a node crash, Ceph is perfectly able to handle this crash, and uh, your end user will not be aware about that. An issue that we had was when uh, the, the node who crashed came back in the cluster. Uh, by default, Ceph wants to synchronize as fast as he can, and uh, it's cool, but sometimes it's, uh, it can be very aggressive uh, depending on the, of the hardware that you are using. So uh, to avoid uh, this kind of degradation, we just uh, tweak some value. You have a, a list of them uh, on the screen. So for example, the recovery threads, by default is set uh, to 2, and uh, we reduce uh, to 1. And uh, as the other, it was very benefic for the, for the nodes, and uh, the user was not uh, disturbed about, Less yeah, uh, about the, uh, the self-synchronization. Other issue that we had, it was uh, very weird. We had uh, a processor, a CPU stuck to 200 megahertz, and uh, we tried to find out if it was, if it was a Linux bug or whatever, and uh, we saw that uh, the hardware profile defined uh, was uh, in power saving. So we changing to we changed it to performance, and uh, we never had this issue again. It's not only related about Ceph; it's uh, related about all your servers. So for the compute, for the the, the storage or the controller, just be sure that you have defined the the, ri the right uh, hardware profile. So the last uh, advice uh, is about uh, Glens, and especially when uh, you are using uh, the same backend, uh, Ceph, for example, for uh, Glens, Cinder, and Nova. And by default, uh, uh, Glens will not uh, uh, show the uh, image direct uh, URL to uh, uh, the, the, the compon component who asked uh, Glens. So if you, uh, uh, for, ex so in for example, when you are spawning a new virtual machine, it will download the image uh, f to Glens. So Glens is running, for example, on the controller. So from the backend to Glens, try to convert it from QCO2, for example, to RAW, or even from RAW to RAW, because it's like that, <laughs> and uh, uh, upload it back to the backend. But it's, it was the same backend, so it was quite useless to download it and upload it again. So by enabling copy and write, uh, setting show image direct URL to true, you will be able to um, expose to Nova or any other components the, the, where the image is actually stored. And uh, it will be way more faster to spawn a new virtual machine. Uh, be uh, advised that it can be a security risk. Don't do that on public cloud, for example, because you don't want to um, expose information about your backend on a public cloud, but if you can um, 
do that on a private cloud, it will be a big uh, improvement in terms of performance when you are starting a virtual machine. So this is uh, all the links of all the software we talked about. So the first one is RDO project, second one is uh, OSP director. Then you have the link to the GitHub to the board we used, and then the handler we wrote. The la next one is uh, the Stackforge, uh, well, it's a Git repository for the uh, monitoring for OpenStack checks we used uh, for Sensu. And the last one is about StackUp, the backup uh, tool we talk about. Uh, I will upload uh, this uh, presentation to SCED or make it available somewhere in the OpenStack uh, website so you will be able to download it. And now, if you have any questions, uh, there's a mic uh, at the, under the uh, camera over there. So feel free to ask any question. I think you had a question just before. So the question is, uh, do we have a white paper for the safe tuning? Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, I never checked uh, about that. Uh, we did some tuning, depending uh, of the hardware, if we are, if we are using SSD, etc. Uh, I think we should have. Uh, the official documentation of Ceph is uh, pretty well, so we can check. Uh, if you have already an NTP server, oh, yeah, I will repeat. Uh, please, next time, if you have a question, please use the mic. It's okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, are we using uh, a local NTP or an external NTP server? Uh, do what you want. <laughs> uh, it depends on your setup. Yeah. If your server has access to uh, uh, internet, you can use external one. But uh, I will say, if I have to choose, uh, an internal one yeah. will be better for your security. For example, you can set up it on the on the cloud, so it's easy and uh, it's uh, more secure. Okay, so thank you, and uh, have a nice summit. Thanks.